Hey everyone, Matt here with Duke's Models. So, as I was finishing up the Tamiya P38, I realized that it represents a milestone of sorts. It's the 75th model I've completed since returning to the hobby way back in the summer of 2010. And it's a bit crazy to think about it, you know, it sure doesn't feel like I've completed 75 builds, but here we are. So, to mark the occasion, I thought it'd be interesting to take a look back at some of the major inflection points I've had over the last 11 years. You know, the places where I feel some aspect of my work really found and kicked into a new gear. So buckle up, and let's get into it. Number one, quality has a quality all its own. When I was taking my first tentative steps back into the hobby, I did so with a cheap, not-so-great kit, Ravel's ancient SPD Dauntless. I guess you could say it was my first brush with modeler versus assembler if you had to. And it wasn't long before I replaced it with a Tamiya P51B Mustang. To say the difference was night and day just doesn't come anywhere close to capturing it. With the Tamiya Mustang, everything fit, and it sped me on my way to my first completion and easily the best model I'd ever built to that point. Now, looking back now, it falls way short of stuff I've done since, but it was far out front of anything I'd done as a kid or a teenager, and it really fueled my interest as I returned to the hobby. Number two. Variation is the spice of life. Fast forward a year and I was working on Tamiya's masterful 132nd scale Spitfire Mark 8. This wasn't my first 132nd scale kit, or my first Tamiya kit, or my first time working with a new paint or any of that kind of stuff, but it was the first build where I started baking in tonal variation at the painting stage, with what I called the three layer blend. Now this is a far, far cry from the variation that I'm working at these days, but it was my first time thinking in terms of layers and painting effects, and that breakthrough only accelerated in coming years. Number three, ma 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 mask 2012 saw me take my first steps beyond decals and use masks to spray insignias and codes on aircraft, specifically HK's B-25 and a Hasegawa BF-109 in Swiss markings. This was an experience that would only continue, particularly in 132nd scale. Number four, stepping away from pre-shading. Throughout my first two years of building, I was mostly pre-shading and then doing my three-layer blend thing. But that began to really break down in 2012, first with a Tamiya Diwa Team D520. It was still pre-shaded, but at this point I began introducing darker squiggles and modeling in the in-between areas as well. And it turned out great. So I started doing more, and on my French P47, I went in with dark grays and greens, which led me down the path to number five. Enter black basing. After a few builds of increasingly dark shading, I finally dispensed with pretense altogether in 2014 and primed my Hasegawa A4 Skyhawk in black before building up what I would come to call my marble and blend coats with light and dark ghost gray. I ended up slapping the name black basing on this general approach, and it served me extremely well for many years since. Number six, a culmination of sorts. Everything I'd been building toward came to a head in 2015 with my Tamiya F4U1 Birdcage Corsair. The Corsair combined black basing and tonal variation with multi-stage chipping and mass and sprayed markings and aggressive oil work for weathering. I think it's fair to say that the Corsair was easily my best build to date. And it also screwed with me. Because it was so much better than what had come before, subsequent builds failed to measure up to the higher and higher levels of expectation that I was placing on myself. More and more builds got stuffed back into boxes, and my output dropped. I went from finishing nine builds in 2014 to just three in 2015, excluding the Corsair, which I only kinda count since I finished it off in January, and you know, that doesn't really fully count as 2015. Believe it or not, it would take me nearly four years to break out of the slump, which I finally did in the beginning of 2019 with the 1 2 finish of the Italeri F 104G and the Zuki Mira F 4D followed later in the year with a Trumpeter P47 Razorback and a Tamiya 1D Corsair. Those last two in particular, I think, finally really excised the ghost of the F4U1 and freed me to move forward. Number seven, let's just make shit up. So that's not to say that nothing happened while I was in my slump. Actually, a lot happened. And one of the things that seemed small at the time, but it's kind of grown since, was my veering off the reservation with my Tacom AML90. I wasn't really feeling any of the kit's camo schemes, so I decided to just make up my own off of kind of an amalgam of different schemes from the box and from reference photos, and it came out great. And it kind of set a worm loose in my brain that it's okay and even more interesting 
to break out the creative license when it comes to armor kits. Number 8. Flight of the Intruder The Corsair wasn't the only build that haunted me. My long, slogging, and ultimately failed go at Trumpeter's 132nd MiG-23 in 2017 also sent me spiraling. Everything was going well, if slow, when I hit a problem with the landing gear being too tall and giving the thing a tiptoe stance that just didn't work. Ultimately, I abandoned it. After already putting a ton of work into the cockpit, the seat, the gear base, you name it, what was already a slump got even worse and my 27 and 2018 output were basically shot to shit as a result. Which is why I count the Trumpeter A6 Intruder as another inflection point. You see, the Intruder had just as much thrown at it and threw nearly as much back as the MiG-23. Between filling the rivets across the entire airframe and strengthening the wings and replacing all the cockpit switches and on and on, it was exactly the sort of massive build that the Flogger was, but I got this one over the line. Number 9. 3D Printing 2021's been a pretty big year for me so far, for several reasons, and one of them has been my tentative steps into 3D printing. I've slowed down the past few months, there's just too much shit going on, but not before successfully printing, building, and finishing a 148 scale TIE Interceptor. My first 3D printed kit, and a pretty damn cool one if I do say so myself. Number 10. Sandwiches. Since tackling that Skyhawk way back in 2014, I've used some variation of black basing with just about every build, though I've been tweaking my exact approach here and there over time. But when it came to my Trumpeter P40F, I strayed pretty far afield and discovered something I might like even more, which I've been dubbing sandwich shading. On the P40, this was done because the colors I was using were typically tricky ones to apply over black, and because I was going to be doing chipping, I needed to be using some silver. So. Instead of coming up through black, I used a silver base, and then built darker versions of the base colors on top of it, browns and blues. And then I shaded between them, added a blend coat, and did more shading on top. This layer sandwich was super effective, and it gave me what I think has to be one of my richest, deepest finishes to date. After the P40, I carried a version of the sandwich shading over to my P38, this time using a 6K brown as an intermediate layer to support the olive drab. And I really look forward to carrying this idea through into future builds. Number 11, Tank the Rainbow. Tank the Rainbow is my big and too much delayed armor project for 2021. The idea of breaking my usual habits, kicking my comfort zones to the curb, and painting tanks in absurd rainbow colors still has a good ways to run, and I don't quite feel it can be called an inflection point yet. That's ultimately going to depend on what comes out of it and what comes after it. But so far, with one build down and paint thrown on two and a half more of the seven vehicles, I think it's fair to say that it's already making me think differently about how I approach armor. Inflection points. Where do they come from? Okay, so that was a quick tour of what I see as the key inflection points in my modeling adventures. But identifying them doesn't really identify why they occur. But I have an idea. So I've found that I really like experimenting. You know, poking and prodding, trying and failing, fucking around and finding out. There's a spontaneity and a serendipity to it. And sure, some experiments fail spectacularly, or they don't really yield any results. But others do work, either as intended or in a way that sparks a connection and leads you towards that next rabbit hole. In some ways, it reminds me of the associative thinking skills I honed as a history student. You know, that ability to hold multiple bits of information and identify possible connections between them and use those as avenues for further inquiry. It's the exact same thing when it comes to modeling and trying different techniques and different approaches and different materials and I think that's where things kick off. You know, I think that thinking, that sort of thinking, seeking element is what drives inflection points. Like that old saying that luck favors the prepared, I think you could probably also say that breakthroughs favor the curious. So what about you? What inflection points have you noticed in your own modeling journey? What do you think fuels them? Where do you think they come from in your life? Pipe up in the comments. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you all later.